Talking about living our vocations with, with uh, St. Joseph as our model and trying to identify some masculine behaviors that St. Joseph models that we, that we are called to as uh, Catholic husbands and fathers. And, uh, so we, let me just start this out by saying, um, you know, we don't know a whole lot about St. Joseph uh, in Scripture. But he's, our main knowledge of him is from the infancy narratives in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, and the one where Matthew's Gospel is the one where the angel appears to Joseph. And Luke's Gospel is the one where uh, Gabriel appears to Mary. Joseph is referenced in both. We don't have a single word reported from him as he's sacred scripture, yet he's the patron saint of the church, the patron saint of fathers and um, husbands. But he's given us, um, how should I, uh, even though we don't know much about him, he was given the most important vocation of any man in history, and that was to help rear the Son of God in his midst. Um, he's the guardian of the Redeemer, as John Paul II said. Uh, he's to, uh, to cause me to pause for reflection to think that he's the only human being, right, the only man that uh, our Lord called Daddy later in his earthly life. Um, and as Jesus' earthly father, you know, it, felt, it felt the same just to help Jesus grow in his manhood. You know, although Jesus is God, right, he possesses the fullness of virtue and the fullness of grace in his human soul. Um, Joseph had was given this incredible vocation of helping to lead Jesus in practicing the virtues and growing in his manhood. There's a mystery there that we'll never fully comprehend. But that was his mission. Um, and he was up to that task because he, he was giving himself a plenty of graces. And he's called the just man in sacred scripture. To call somebody the just man in scriptural terms means that he follows the law in all things. And not just the letter of the law. But he follows it in accord with the spirit of the law and with love. And he is a man who loved with God, a man who sees in God's law freedom and a way to be perfected in love. So um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, I looked this up briefly. He, he actually said after Mary, uh, no one conceived. There's no. Uh, teaching that says Joseph was similarly immaculately conceived because the, the Leo the Thirteenth did say that after Mary there's nobody holier uh, than Joseph. So, um, so where does where does this apply to us? So where do we see the type of man that Joseph was? Well, if he had the responsibility of leading Jesus and growing in his manhood and you know, practicing virtue and becoming a, a faithful um, Jewish man, right? Who ended up who was the Messiah? Who was God among us? If that was his mission, then uh, we can see something of St. Joseph reflected in Jesus' in ministry. Right? And when we see Jesus um, exhibiting certain you know, masculine behaviors, virtues, attitudes, I think it's pretty clear that well, we see Joseph reflected in him. So it's just, uh, so I'm coming up, what I'm doing is to, to take certain behaviors that we see in Jesus. And and, uh, and then kind of some, and some of this is, is admittedly kind of prayerful thinking on my own, and seeing how we see how Joseph exercised the same behaviors and then how they apply to us. Okay. I got ten points. None of them are very long. Okay. Um, so the first thing, um, Joseph knew who he was in relation to the Father. Um, how do we know this? Well, you know, Jesus defines his whole ministry, his whole existence, in terms of his relationship to his Father. And from all eternity, Jesus, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. But in his earthly life, we see Jesus constantly. Everything he does is with reference to the Father and the mission the Father gave him. But I think it's safe to say that, you know, in his manhood, he sees his, his earthly adopted father, his foster father, Joseph, you know, doing the same thing. That Joseph knew who he was in relationship to the Father. He never did anything apart from God. He, never, he was the just man. He never did anything apart from God's law. Um, his whole life was in relationship to the Heavenly Father, um, which is ultimately the mark of profound humility. Like, humility isn't humiliation. It's not thinking less of ourselves, but it's thinking of ourselves less. And it's knowing who we are in relationship to God, knowing that God is God. We're, we are who we are. We're not God. Right, and living our whole life in reference to this relationship with the Heavenly Father. Joseph did that. You know, and that's something that, that we can do right, as Catholic husbands and fathers. Second point. Uh, 
Joseph was decisive, and he was a uh, problem solver, and he was a man of action. Um, how do we know that? Well, um, we see in Jesus, you know, when he's in his, he's exercising his public ministry, when there's a problem to be solved, he assesses the situation and he's comes up with a solution. The feeding of the, of the 5,000. Right? Um, he sees there's a problem there. He knows what to do. He sets about giving, giving instructions to his disciples, his apostles, and he solves the problem. Um, but we also see it in Joseph, and we do see this in Scripture itself. Right? In Joseph, you know, when, um, when the angel appears to him in a dream, he says that the, the Herod is uh, after your, your, your child. Uh, well, Picks, it, picks up, right? he figures out what he needs to do to get out of town, right? and he leaves. And one has to think that you know, the, the whole time he's, he's, he's solving this problem, making this decision, in a, not in a, a rash, you know, kind of reactionary way, but in a way which is measured, where he knows what he needs to do, and he sets about doing it um, decisively. He doesn't hesitate. So to me, this. Um, problem solver, this man of action, to be decisive when necessary. That's also a mark of the Catholic husband and father. Um, by the way, I should have said, uh, opened this whole thing by saying, you guys, you guys are, most of you in this room, much further along in your vocations as husbands and fathers than I am. I just am trying to put together a for reflection. I don't stand in front of any group of men and claim to have everything together and claim to be the husband, perfect husband and father. I made many mistakes and I'll make many more. I can learn more from you than you probably but these are just my kind of points for, for reflection to, for all of us um, to the best of my ability. Third point, Joseph exhibited resolve and perseverance. You know, after he makes decisions, um, he says he goes forward with resolve and perseverance. We see that in Jesus clearly in his earth, earthly ministry. You know, he sets, Jesus sets his face like flint. You know, like, you know, that's from the prophet Isaiah. You know, to go forward to fulfill the mission the Father has given him to fulfill. You know, with resolve with perseverance. Um, no matter what obstacles that he faces, he continues, he continues to go forward. And I think that's not just implicit, but that's presumed in the text for, about Joseph you know, taking care of Mary and Jesus when they're fleeing and the Egypt and back. Uh, so there's all perseverance. Number four, uh, Joseph was other centered. You know, clearly, we see this in Jesus' ministry. You know, he is the man for others, he's sent by the Father you know, for our salvation. He is, his whole existence is a for others' existence. You know, um, never thinking about himself, but always about others. And if we can presume that Joseph was the same way. You know, he's thinking constantly about Mary, about Jesus, about how he needs to provide for them, about the mission that God has given him. Um, and I'm sure Joseph had plans for himself. You know, prior to being led to Mary, even as he was engaged to Mary, I'm pretty sure but he had plans, you know, as a, as a future husband and father, you know, but he puts all those aside um, to be centered on Mary and Jesus in the way that God is asking him to do. Um, it's not about him at all. He's, I think it's the fact that there are no words that he spoke according to the sacred scripture that actually speaks volumes of God because he is, it's not about him. It's about everybody else. Um, number five, Joseph exhibits self mastery. Um, we certainly see Jesus, you know, exhibiting self mastery, you know, control of his of all of the emotions and all of his passions throughout his entire earthly ministry. So would Joseph have been. Joseph is the one who leads Jesus, right, and in, in growing in these virtues and in, in, in showing him how to be a. a an integrated, self-mastered man, um, and we can expect that that's exactly what he was. That he was an integrated, self-mastered man. That he, he was in control of his passions and desires, not allowing them to control him. All right, so that's number five, I think. So I got five more. Okay. Okay. Number six, uh, Joseph exercised responsibility. Uh, this is a link to self-mastery not only over himself and his own affairs, but he ought to exercise responsibility in taking care of, of those that God had given him to take care of. That's just kind of dovetailing upon a couple of the previous points, but to be, a, to be responsible you know, is certainly a mark of a, of, a, of a Catholic Christian man. 
Um, we live in a society where people are kind of encouraged to be responsible. Just do it no matter what, whatever you're talking about. But we see Jesus, you know, taking responsibility for others' salvation. Um, and we see he, he certainly would have learned responsibility you know, for himself and for others from his from his dad, from Joseph. How to be responsible. Number seven, uh, Joseph uh, showed um, this one. This one, granted, is a little bit more of a spiritual reflection, um, not so explicitly in scripture. But I think Joseph would have shown masculine uh, tenderness, gentleness, sensitivity. Like, why do I say that? Because I, when um, in in all of our um, in all of Jesus' earthly ministry, and everything we have about him in the Gospels, he inter interacts with people with great sensitivity, with great tenderness, with great gentleness. He calls people to conversion, and he doesn't. He loves everybody. Uh, this is from a Dominican friend of mine. Jesus did it, 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 uh, has a teacher. He said, you know, Jesus loves everybody just the way they are, but too much to leave them that way. Right. Um, so when he encounters people, like, for instance, the woman caught in adultery, right, and um, he, she's about to be stoned. Right, this episode in the Gospels where she's caught in adultery, she's straight out in the street, she's about to be stoned. And uh, Jesus deals with the situation by kind of looking at everybody there and saying, okay, well, you without any sin, you cast the first stone. Um, he does this strange this strange gesture of bending down and writing in the sand. There are all kinds of commentaries about that throughout the centuries. Nobody makes that, knows exactly what he was doing. But the one speculation I kind of like the most is that he was bending down and writing in the, the sins of others in the ground. Um, we don't know if that's true, but I like that speculation. Because he's calling people to take account of themselves before they condemn this woman. So they walk then they walk away. You know, and Jesus is, you know, saying saying he who was about sin cast the first stone. Clearly Jesus could have cast the stone. He was the only one there about sin. But instead what he does is he looks at this woman with great sensitivity, and with great gentle gentleness, with great tenderness. And I've always um, envisioned how this was in my mind that the, the movie The Passion of the Christ almost captured what I had ever had imagined a scene to look like. And where Jesus just looks at this woman with incredible tenderness and says, uh, Has no one remained to condemn you? And she says, No. And he says, Neither do I go to sin no more. And in that moment, he gives her new life. You know, with this tenderness, with this sensitivity, with this gentleness. But at the same time, calling her to a different level of existence. And so masculine sensitivity is, is a and gentleness and, and tenderness is it calls people to new levels, new heights. Right? It does uh, doesn't it doesn't seek to leave your loved ones where that you found them, but to draw them up to greater heights. And, and I think that type of tenderness and sensitivity and gentleness would have been a hallmark of Saint Joseph. That he would have exhibited that same type of tenderness with people in his life, and Jesus saw him, you know, doing this, and then is prepared to exercise that same way in his earthly ministry. All right, uh, three more. Number eight. Uh, Joseph showed a capacity for self-sacrifice. Clearly, we see this in our Lord. You know, who gives himself to the very end, goes as far as love can go on the cross, and spares nothing for those that he loves. But we do see it also in, in the Gospels in St. Joseph. You know, the, the sacrifice that it would have taken Joseph to get Mary and Jesus out of town right, to flee into Egypt. That's not an easy trip. On foot, right? You know, on a, it's, um, and prior to that, taking her to Bethlehem, you know, where she's giving birth. You know, it's, there's a lot of sacrifice involved in the way that, that Joseph took care of his wife and of his adopted son. Um, and seeing that in his own earthly adopted father, you know, who, who this was part of God's plan for Joseph to exhibit that so that Jesus himself should have sought the self-sacrifice throughout his own ministry. All right, two more. Ninth, ninth uh, behavior of St. Joseph. He was, uh, I think we can assume he was vulnerable and compassionate. I'm distinguishing this a little bit from the tenderness and gentleness that I talked about earlier, but you can maybe put them together. Um, vulnerable and compassionate. This is something that, you know, um, we see in our Lord uh, 
I think most clearly the episode that comes to my mind is when he raises Lazarus from the dead. And he comes upon the scene, Martha and Mary meet him, and uh, he must have been really close friends with his family. And they, he loved them a great deal. Uh, and um, he comes upon the scene, and you know, Mary says, if, uh, if you'd just been here, he wouldn't have died. He said, well, he's still, he's still will live. But he, he, as he comes up to the tomb, you know, the, it's one of the most interesting passages, I think, in the Gospels is where it says Jesus uh, wept. But the term behind that is that a, a, a scripture professor of mine at one point pointed out, it seems, this isn't just like he wept and he cried. It's like he was so disturbed, his very body was just shaking. It's like deeply disturbed. So Jesus knows he's going to raise him from the dead, so why is he so disturbed? Because ultimately, Jesus is the sinless one knows that the ultimate result of sin is death, and this was not supposed to happen. Sin was not, that death was not supposed to be part of the cards for the human person, God's original plan. And he looks upon this situation and, and with such, <coughs> such compassion and vulnerability, meaning, and by the way, not being afraid to show his own emotions, you know, his own love, his own, his, his own disturbance in the face of this. Which I think is something that, you know, at least I'll tell you, you say from my, my as a person, like, I, I find that difficult to do at times in life. To be appropriately vulnerable and to actually let people in to show how, you know, how deeply things are moving me. Instead of, you know, our, kind of this cultural expectation to just be, be strong. And, if there's anything about this injury right, right now without making this a personal self-reflection, I think that's something that God's trying to teach me in this. I, uh, I'm, I, I'm very weak right now, and I need help. And I need to let people know that. Uh, so Joseph, I think seeing that in Jesus, we can expect that he learned that from, <coughs> from his earthly father, from Joseph. Uh, and then 10th, uh, uh, Joseph lived for the kingdom. Uh, we know that everything about Jesus' earthly ministry was about spreading the kingdom of God, serving the kingdom of God. Right? Everything was oriented uh, around that one goal. That was all that mattered for our Lord. And, it, and I think we can presume he learns to live for the kingdom from Joseph himself. Everything that Joseph does is about furthering God's kingdom. He has God's kingdom in his midst, in his home, right? in the person of Christ. And he, served, he, he forms his whole life, whatever, whatever plans he had prior you know, to God calling him to this particularly incredible vocation. Right? Everything gets reoriented around serving the kingdom and the person of Christ. So, um, those are my thoughts for this morning. I, uh, I, I hope that I was, that was coherent. Um, I hope that in some way that gives you something to think about. Um, um, it's my, you know, people attempt at trying to just you think about well, what does St. Joseph show us as, as a dad, as a father, as a man? Um, and how can we emulate him? And, um, so uh, you probably have even better insights than those, but hopefully this is uh, this is give you something to talk about this morning. So any <laughs> Thanks for sharing your time and your your talents. Um, does anybody have any questions for uh, for Perry? Because one of the things that I'm going to do is after we get this all done, I'm going to work with John.